What is going on YouTube? I am Prepper Princess, the author of Living on Almost Nothing. If you are interested in purchasing my book, I will go ahead and leave a link down in the description box below. And also, if you could, please hit the thumbs up or the thumbs down button, whatever your thing is. Um, it really helps me with the YouTube algorithm so that my videos get recommended to a lot more people. Um, so today we're going to go over how to find a cheap house, what to look for in a neighborhood, how you know it's a good neighborhood, a bad neighborhood, how I choose my houses, which I would never recommend to anybody else but I'll just tell you how I do it. Um, things that people are afraid of and should not be afraid of and all this other stuff. Okay, so first and foremost, you should know that a house is a liability, not an asset. If you are taking out a loan on your house, keep in mind that the average house is about $485,000 in the United States of America, if you're putting down 20% and you're taking out a 30-year loan, you might as well double the price of that. It's going to be a $950,000 house because you're paying more in interest than you, or, uh, well, it depends on the interest rate, but you're paying, you're pretty much doubling the price of your house if you're taking out a loan. If you're paying out in cash, that's a different thing. Let me give you a little bit of background. Um, first house that I had um, was, uh, I don't like saying inheritance, but it was an inheritance, but there was still a mortgage. So when my mother passed away, I moved into her house, took over the mortgage, and I paid off the mortgage with my own money. And, um, then after that, we sold that house because it was partially my brother's. And then I moved to Arizona where I paid $67,000 for a house. It doubled in value in about two years. Now I live in the back in the state of California where the average price of a home is $783,000 at the time that I am making this video. And my house was less than $200,000. Um, so I'm pretty good at finding thrifty things, but the thing is, is that I don't see this house as an investment. I see it as a liability. So if I'm seeing my home, the place that I live in, as a liability, I want to pay as little as humanly possible. I can take a piece of junk house and I'll make it comfortable enough for me to live in. I've been slowly remodeling. It's a fixer upper. You guys know the drill. Okay, so if you were looking for a cheap house, um, there's several different things that you can do. And yes, there are good houses in bad neighborhoods and there are bad houses in good neighborhoods and there's everything in between. And I don't look at buying a house as a lifetime purchase. That's just not the way that I look at it because I don't have, I, I'm like a homeless person with a home. Like nothing is home to me. It's just a house that I happen to live in, um, until I decide to move on. That's just the way that I look at it. Nobody, not really anybody stays in their house for their whole lives. It's very rare these days. Um, so the first thing that you can look for when looking for a house that is cheaper is a house without a garage. That's going to take $50,000 off of the price of the house right away because that's about the value of a garage. To build your own garage, I was looking around and Lowe's will build a single car garage on your property for like... Fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars, and that includes assembling it. So, if you think about it this way, you can save fifty thousand dollars on your house, and then you can spend fifteen, and then you just brought the value of your house up fifty thousand dollars by putting in your own garage. Um, the there's not a whole lot of difference in price when it comes to one car garage or two car garage. Uh, people just really, really want a garage. This house has a carport in the backyard. I'm still trying to de archaeologically decipher what this house was and is and whatever decisions people made. It's so, and I keep digging up driveways and pathways and, and I think that my carport used to be a house, like not the, anyway, okay, I don't want it. that's too, TMI. Okay, number two that will save you about $25,000 is a house that has only one bathroom. It is not impossible to live with one bathroom. I grew up with one bathroom. The house had two, but we rented out the room that had the bathroom because my mom was, we were poor, so we always had a roommate. Um, so our whole family had to uh, 
uh, share the front bathroom. So living with one bathroom, even a family of four, it's doable. It's not always fun. You don't like, you know, walking in after somebody took a poop, but you know, you get used to it. So any house with one bathroom instead of two is about $25,000 less than a, ba- than a house that would have two bathrooms. Number three, and this one's one that people kind of look over. If you live one or two houses away from a power transformer on the, on the power line, so the power, if you're following the power lines and you see a big beige box or um, some of them are cylindrical silver boxes. That's a transformer. And for some reason, uh, that brings the value of a house down by like ten or $20,000. This one has a, tra- the electricity comes in in the backyard, but it's on a transformer. So I'm like kitty corner to a transformer. So that saved me 20000 I have no garage. That saved me 50000 It's only got one bathroom. That's $25,000. Uh, number four, is if your house needs updating, like it is usable as is, but it's just ugly from the 1970s. Um, They had weird trends back then. You can update it yourself, which is what I'm doing, but that's going to save you about 30,000 if it needs updating. Like for instance, just look at my floor. Um, The wood here is from the 1950s. This is like the best, most valuable type flooring and it is, you can't find it anywhere else. And if you have this type of flooring, which I love, you keep it. (laughs) I love this floor, but I'm going to refinish the floor, but it's going to be the absolute last thing that I do in this house because I've got to raise the ceiling. I need a new roof, um, painting the living room, read a whole bunch of stuff. Always do the floors last, but when you do them, oh man, especially if they're professionally done, it's going to be gorgeous. Gorgeous. Number five. Oh, in the bathroom. Oh my God. I have a three quarter size bathtub. I don't even have a normal size bathtub. It sucks. I'm, that's an update that's going to happen. Anyway, number five. So it's sort of like the garage, except if you don't have a driveway. So if you have a house that is uh, fenced in all around and there's no driveway, so you only have street parking, that's going to... Hey! <coughs> oh, excuse me. <laughs> that's going to save you about $20,000. Now, the cool thing about a driveway is you can put one in yourself. You can do it for cheap yourself. You can hire somebody and do it anywhere from six to $9,000, but it's going to take 20000 off the value of your house. So you're saving, just think of all these, this is like $100,000 that you're saving. And if you wanted to put all these things in, it's about a quarter of the price. And then when you do go to sell, it's going to increase the value of your home. Um, number six is a fixer upper. Now, a fixer upper can be cosmetic. So, and you're looking at about saving at about thirty to fifty thousand dollars, depending on where you live. Um, a fixer upper is a place that hasn't been updated, and it's also going to have some problems. Now, here's some problems that houses have that I am not afraid of, but keeps potential buyers way. They're just like, I, I don't want it. I don't want it. I'm scared of that. Um, that is number one, foundation issues. So you can take $30,000 off the price of a house for a foundation issue and people will stay away from that house. The thing is, is that most foundation problems can be solved between six and $10,000. So you have a foundation problem. They take 30,000 off the price of the house, but you only have to pay 10 to fix it. And that's, that's kind of on the higher end. Foundation issues are not nearly as bad as people make them out to be. Uh, the second one in regard to that is the roof. It needs a new roof. So this house needs a new roof. Um, who, by the way, who puts solar panels on like a 50 year old roof? That makes no sense to me. And I don't understand it. It needs a new roof. Um, not because there's anything wrong with it. It's not leaking. There's no missing shingles. There's, it's just really, really old. And my insurance company is telling me that they'll drop my insurance unless I get a new roof. So I ha- I'm saving up for a new roof. But I'm not afraid of buying a house that needs a new roof because, again, you can take $30,000 off the price, but it's going to cost you, if you can do it yourself, 6000 bucks. but four to 6,000, you know, depending on the size of your house, but you can pay somebody 10 to 12 or 15,000 to put in a new roof where you're taking 30,000. So that's a half price savings. 
Um, another one is bugs and termites. Now I've never, I've never, um, gotten a house that has any bug or termite problems, but I would not be, I I would not stay away from a house just because of that issue. So you can take $30,000 off of a house that has termites because people automatically assume that it's completely rotted and your house is going to fall down like within the next year or two. Tent your house. Get your house tent, tented and fumigated. Um, 1500 to 2000 bucks to do that. And it's not really a big issue. When I sold my house in Livermore, California, um, we had termites and we didn't even know it. One of the things about selling the house, and I'll get into this stuff later, but one of the things about selling a house is when you do sell a house in the Bay Area of California, they want it to already be tented. So we had to tent it before we even put it up for sale. Um, number seven, a manufactured home. So for some reason, by the way, manufactured homes are now made as well as regular houses. You know, it's not 1950 where a manufactured home, you had to live in a trailer park and they're in bad condition and stuff. My grandma lived in a manufactured home, one of the nicer homes she had, and it was on a foundation. <clears throat> and they're they're really we call them snap together houses but they're actually they're really nice they've got great insulation um really good um like the elect you don't have to uh insulated insulated really well don't be afraid of a manufactured house but other people are because they don't appreciate in value as much as a stick built home so if you are going to live in a house and you do not plan on ever selling it, then you know consider a manufactured home because they're made really well. It's going to last the rest of your life and they're like half the price of a stick built home, but they're just as high quality. So don't be afraid of manufactured homes. Number eight, if you're older, you're going to find cheaper houses in 55 plus gated communities or places that have HOA fees. Now you're like, no HOA fees. Yes and no. So there are some places that really suck. Like (laughs) you go in there and they're like, oh yeah, lot rents 150 a month. But then there's all these stipulations on top of it. Like you have to have their cable, their water, um, their, I don't know, fund in order to fund whatever it is that this is. So your HOA fee turns out to be like seven or $800 a month. That's horrible. But there's also places that have like a community center, like they're, they're in a community and they have like a swimming pool and like a lodge and, um, they only cost like 50 to $75 a month. You can have whatever, uh, a, a cable you want. And, and by the way, some places that have HOA, you have to have cable and it's the cable that they make you have. You can't have anything else. Um, but there's some places that are different. It depends. It really does depend on where you live. And if you're paying 50 to $75 a month for boat launching ability, like you have your own private lake with boat launching, um, and you've got a lodge and a gated community and a swimming pool, a splash pad, all this cool stuff, $75 a month is not a lot to ask for, you know? So it really does depend. But if you're, you know, $75 a month is not bad. They don't force you to have cable. You can do, and some of these places are just on specific land where, yes, you can hang your laundry out to dry. Yes, you can have a busted, beat up old car in your driveway. Nobody cares. Um, The HOA fee is exclusively for the lodge and the swimming pool, and you are required to pay it. But that keeps so many people away. So many people. So just make sure if you want to go to a place that has HOA and you can afford it, make sure there's not like this small print that says like you have to have this and do this and that and the other thing. It's very specific. So be careful with that. But that will like your house will be half the price, like half the price. Um, number nine is foreclosure, foreclosure in bank owned homes or even real estate owned homes. Um The bad part about buying these types of houses is that you have to pay in cash. You can't get a loan form. No bank is going to give you a loan, no matter what they say. Um, So be careful of that. But if you buy a foreclosure or bank-owned home, you can get it anywhere from, I mean, you can go as low as 10 to 25% of the value of the home. So you have instant equity. You could just go in, paint it, 
put it back up for sale and within six months you've you've quadrupled your money that that can happen and I've seen it happen and I've missed a lot of opportunities because I'm stupid sometimes <laughs> so uh, definitely check check into that if you have the cash number 11 is buying an old house so I don't know why. I, I don't understand why. It's always about location, location, location for me. But a lot of people don't want to buy houses that are 70 years old or older or 75 years old or older. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know why. I, I, I have no idea why. Maybe they don't like the design of the house or they think it's going to be a lot of work to upkeep it or something. I, I honestly don't know why, but they're super, super cheap. And my house is like 120, 115 years old, super old. It's a craftsman style. You can see it in the background. And I have a neighbor two doors down who redid her entire craftsman. She took these out. I want to take mine out. <laughs> Hers looks really nice and really big and open. Um, and number 10 is living in a small town. So there's a new song out. Try that in a small town. I can't sing. Um, so even though I'm in California and people call it California. Um, so I live in a small town and it's red as red can be here. <laughs> Like it is red. Like people make sure that you believe in the Second Amendment. It's like a requirement before moving in here. Um, but the thing about living in a small town is number one, the job. There are job opportunities no matter what. But the job opportunities are like not going to be what you would get in Sacramento or San Francisco. So over there, you're making 150k a year. Here, you're making 60 to 80k a year. But the difference is. $783,000 for a house or $200,000 for a house. So it's kind of the same thing. And one of the other negatives also is that you're not really close to hospitals. As we age and we get older, we do need to be close to doctors and hospitals. That is a big thing. So those are the money saving things. So let's go to a couple of things about um, choosing a neighborhood. When I go to a neighborhood... <laughs> There is nothing better than seeing an old lady walking her poodle or a girl in her 20s jogging with her headphones in because that tells me a lot. That tells me that it is a neighborhood where an old woman feels safe walking alone with her dog that is not a pit bull um, that is wearing a heavy chain to make it look meaner than it is. So when I see that, I see a safe community. When I see a girl jogging wearing headphones, she's obviously not caring about hearing her surroundings like gunshots are being robbed or pulled off the trail and beaten up or whatever. Um, so she feels safe enough to where she doesn't even have to hear anything and she's jogging down the trail to get her exercise or jogging down the sidewalk. Another thing that I like to see in a neighborhood is sidewalks. <laughs> There's a lot of places in the United States that don't have sidewalks. And honestly, you are living, if you have a sidewalk in front of your house, you are in a blessed area, more than likely. Like you are in a really good area if you have a sidewalk. Um, there is nothing wrong with not having a sidewalk. That is another thing that is going to bring down the value of a house. So look for that if you're looking for something cheaper, something without sidewalks. Um, another thing that I like to do is I like to listen to a neighborhood. So if I walk out of my car, the first thing I'm going to do is stop and I'm going to look around. I'm going to look for potholes in the street. If the street is not well taken care of, it's more than likely that the inhabitants of that street are not going to be taking care of their property as much as they would if they lived in a beautifully paved, nice area. So if there's potholes all over the street, that's an indicator for a lower cost neighborhood. And you can want a higher cost or you can want a lower cost. You can move into the pothole infested place and then uh, go to your city council and say, we need funds to fix this street and maybe eventually they'll, they'll fix it. I also look for um, is... So if, if the front yard is gated, that's just a preference of what you want the house to look like. But if you have a bully breed dog or more than one, 
chained up in your front yard. I'm talking like a chain. Like I'm not talking about like a dog leash or um, I'm talking like you have a pit bull that's got like spikes on its collars and it has a heavy chain and it is attached to something in your front yard. I don't want to live near you because you are a jerk to your dogs for starters. Um, Second of all, they are not trained because they're barking at me. Um, and they're also violent and I have dogs and I don't want my dogs to be around other dogs that are violent in case that dog breaks out or if my dog breaks out, that would be terrifying for me. Um, I also look at, do any of the houses on my block have, um, broken down vehicles collecting dust and cobwebs and spider webs in their driveways? Um, I also look for junk in the front yard. Do you have old broken down lawnmowers and children's bicycles that are pushed over and not using the kickstand? Is Does it look unorganized? Do you literally save cans and bottles in your front yard that you have strewn about all over the place that you're going to go and recycle someday when you feel like it? Um, I also look for uh, houses that have a lot of cars. So if my house is a thousand square feet, and your house is a thousand square feet. I have one car in my driveway, but you have 10. So that tells me that I am living in a neighborhood where the people living next to me are not educated enough to make a decent living. So they have 10 people living in one house. So they're, they do not value themselves well enough to make enough of a living to afford their own dwelling but they can afford 10 cars, which if they sold their 10 cars, they could afford a dwelling. Anyway, <clears throat> um, I also look, the, the only two things that are a no, the only thing that will cause me not to buy a house are two things. One, graffiti. If there's graffiti anywhere in, my, in the neighborhood that I'm looking at, I won't buy it. Not gonna happen. I will not be near anywhere that has graffiti. Number two is... Um, a food desert. So if the only options I have are Jack in the Box, Arby's, Wendy's, uh, Taco Bell, McDonald's, Burger King, that sort of thing, but there's no grocery store that has fresh fruit and vegetables, I won't live in that area. Those are two indicators to me that the crime is really high so that if they were to open a grocery store, there would be so much theft that they're not willing to open a grocery store in that area. And it's also an economic indicator, meaning that um, there's not enough jobs or enough people willing to work in that neighborhood in order to open a grocery store. Now, I, there is you can look up statistics online about like the poverty level in your area. I don't care about that. Um, and, and I think that it's somewhat... I just, I, I mean, there's, it doesn't really matter. I don't care if you are poor or live under the poverty level, but if that, if you can't keep your home in order and you bring down the value of everybody else's house, that's a problem. Um, if you blast your music at all hours of the night and you're in and out of the house all hours of the night, that's a problem. But if you're poor, you know, and you're working a minimum wage job, I've got no problem with that. No problem with that. But you have to have self-respect and dignity if I am going to live near you. You can, you can call me whatever you want for those, <laughs> for that. Call me whatever you want, judge however you like, but that's, I'm, I'm not going to live in a neighborhood like that. So when it comes to selling, in order to get the most money for your buck, the most, the most dollars for your sale, so there's a few things you can do. First of all, curb appeal is like the biggest thing. Um, it's, curb appeal is more important, is, is just as important as the interior of your house and that's the exterior so you want to keep your your plants nice and trimmed if you have rose bushes trim those uh, leave some nice fresh roses on your front porch uh, so that the potential buyer can see those um, if you have like dead grass right now right now I have dead grass I don't have a sprinkler system but I've got two trees two big giant trees <laughs> in my front yard it's a small front yard and a huge backyard so what I would recommend is getting one of those circular things that you can put around the trunk of a tree and just adding black bark that black bark is like 350 per bag and you only need two bags because there's like two trees so like for seven dollars you know you could potentially make your your front yard look so much better so much better. Um, 
And um, you want to make sure that, you know, even if you only grow weeds, mow your weeds. Um, and the best time to sell is, of course, when the grass is green. But right now it's it's not. Anyway, um, trim your trees as best you can so that when the potential buyer walks up to your house, they're not hitting their head on the branches of your tree. Um, paint your front door black, even if it you think it doesn't go with the house, and put a kick plate on it. You can get kick plates that are 20 bucks and uh, black paint you can get just a, you all you need is a quart for a front door so a quart of black paint and a kick plate is going to increase the value right away it's going to make them feel like they have a brand new door which is awesome when you move on inside the things that i would recommend first and foremost is window and door trim and baseboards um, painted white they're not expensive you can install them yourself pretty easy to do. I've gotten pretty good at trim. Um, but that just leaves, it, it provides dimension to the room and it increases the value of the house. And then when it comes to painting, don't paint white. I hate white. Don't paint gray either. Um, I would recommend a really light off white, paint all of your trim and all of your baseboards white, and then paint all of your walls, every wall, everything from the kitchen, the bathroom, the dining room, the living room, to an, a light off white neutral color. Get rid of all of the clutter. That means any rugs, any pillows, <clears throat> any photos, um, any sort of clutter in your house, get rid of it. When it comes to bedrooms, the only thing that you should have in your bedroom is a really nice, really well made bed and Side tables with a lamp on each side, that's it. You should take out the dresser, put it in your shed, put it in the backyard, put it in the garage. Don't care where you put it. Get rid of everything else in the bedroom except for that. It's going to make it seem so much bigger than it really is. And if you have anything done to your house, I would recommend having a... I would recommend tenting your house, keeping the receipt... I would recommend having um, an inspection done, keeping the receipt and any issues that are on the inspection, try and repair those as best you can before you put your house up for sale. Um, and especially if you have done any of the things that I was talking about, like you fix the foundation, you put on a new roof, keep the receipts for those. Keep every single receipt so that when the buyer comes and says you need a new roof, you can say, no, it's only two years old. Here's the receipt. So that they're not trying to haggle the price down while you're trying to get the price as high as possible. Um, let me think here. Include all appliances with the sale of your house and make sure that the appliances are stainless steel. Because even though they cost the same as black or white, for some reason they make it seem more prestigious. So I would recommend... Um, buying stainless steel appliances and including them with the sale of your house. Same with the washer and dryer. Washer and dryer don't have to be stainless steel, but include them with the price of the house. And make sure that all your gutters are cleaned and you've picked up all the dog poop and you've just done as much curb appeal as you possibly can. And I did tell you the way that I would choose that I choose my house, which I would never, ever, ever recommend to anyone else. And I know I'm going to get a lot of heat for this. I'm going to they're going to be like people are going to be like, what is man? Prepper Princess is really stupid. <laughs> this is literally how I choose a house. When I moved from Livermore to Bullhead City, I had a friend who lived there. I call I looked online I found the absolute cheapest stick built house that was on the market. It was listed for 74. I called the realtor. I said, I'll do 67 cash, no inspections, no questions asked, cash offer. I sold it in a day. <laughs> they sold it to me. They sold it to me in a day. Now that was a really great investment because it's doubled in price and it rents out for $1,500 a month. This one, this one, I called a realtor. I said, um, I want a house for 200000 He said, that's not going to happen. And I said, make it happen. 200000 no inspections, <laughs> no inspections, cash price offer, no questions asked. And he says, I'll see what I can do. The next day he goes, I found one. <laughs> or he, he said, I found two. And he did, he found two. Um, the first one, I said no. And the reason I said no, and it's too bad because it probably, if, if I wouldn't have had to deal with it, Anyway, 
It was in Chico, which is a really high class place, but I don't like Chico because even though it's high class, it's very liberal and blue and it's so condensed it feels crowded it's it's just a crowded city and he he found me this one and he was giving me this tour where the the person who was selling it was the owner but there was a renter in the house and the renter was being very irritable and almost to the brink of violence with the realtor and the real and he was uh growing weed um on on the property which i don't care about growing weed but um, the guy didn't want to leave. So I knew that if I bought that house, I was going to have a squatter and I was going to have to go through six months to two years of trying to get him off the property without being able to live there. And that's too bad because it was like a three bed, two bath, decent sized backyard, but it was also in a bad neighborhood right next to a homeless encampment and there were broken windows on the house. So, um, and he was a drug user. So, um, I didn't want to deal with that. This one, never went to market. It was actually like a short sale. The previous owner, um, his son, the owner was like in his nineties. He's still alive, but his son, um, he was making a lot of bad financial choices, like the solar on a 50 year old roof. And, um, it, when he sold it to me, he actually had a loss. So he had lived here for 16 years with his wife, his wife, Opal. Um, and, um, when he left, he actually, he still, he owed more than he made. So I gave the 200,000, which was, it was less than 200, but with all the realtor fees and stuff, it came out to 200,000. But, um, because he still owed on the solar and he still owed on the mortgage, he took the money and he paid it and he still owed thousands of dollars on the mortgage, even after selling to me. But he was made, his son forced him to move out because he was making a lot of really bad financial choices and he was getting older in age and he couldn't keep up the property. He just couldn't do it. So that's why everything in this house is totally outdated. As you can see from my heating system, there's no HVAC or air conditioning, um, the ceiling is drooping and needs to be taken up. I remodeled the kitchen and the dining room and the bedrooms. Uh, the next is going to be the roof, the living room. I mean, then the bathroom, and then I'll, I'll start moving on outward into the front and backyard, but I enjoy it. I love doing this stuff. I don't know what's wrong with me. I know there's something wrong with me for enjoying doing this, but I love taking something ugly and making it beautiful. I don't know why. All right, folks, it's getting late and I have been talking for way too long and I've been talking really fast to try and make the video shorter, but I hope this video has been useful to you. And again, please hit the thumbs up button because I really, really could use your help in showing this on the YouTube algorithm so that I can get more views and continue to grow and teach you guys how to save money. All right, folks, do what you can with what you've got. Prepper Princess out.